Um, hi everyone, my name is Adam. Uh, I'm the user acquisition manager at Playside Studios. Um, I guess my presentation today kind of takes me away from my usual responsibilities, but I also sit on the diversity and inclusion committee at Playside Studio, where our core responsibility is basically promoting uh, diversity and inclusion across uh, three key pillars. Uh, it's women in gaming, neurodiversity, um, as well as uh, diversity for the LGBTIAQ plus community. And I know that's quite an acronym, but uh, we'll get to that in a second. Um, today, I'm excited to present to you um, my presentation on Beyond Binary, um, Embracing Inclusivity and Diversity in Game Design. <clears throat> um, and while there are many facets of diversity which could be included under this title, um, predominantly today we're going to be focusing on diversity related to the LGBTIAQ plus community. You're going to hear me say the acronym a lot today. So, um, and I guess um, in my role as user acquisition manager, I know that I use acronyms every single day. Sometimes I say them to people and they have no idea what I'm talking about. And I think it can be very similar when referring to the LGBTIAQ plus community as well. Um, so I think a first good step uh, for the presentation today is to properly go through and kind of actually make sure we understand exactly who we're talking about when we reference the LGBTIAQ plus community. Um, it can also be referred to as the queer community um, as well. Um, I think it's very interesting to look at this acronym. There's actually a lot of things going on when we look at the LGBTIAQ plus acronym. Um, we have here uh, the letters for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and asexual, which are all um, types of sexual orientation or uh, interpersonal connection. We also have acronyms for transgender and queer or questioning people, which are actually types of gender, um, gender identity. There is an I, which stands for intersex, which is actually a, um, a, an acronym used to describe someone's biological sex. And together we have the LGBTIQ plus community. <clears throat> um, sorry. Cool. Um, so with all of these terms combined, we can understand that there is a lot of diversity going on within the LGBTIQ plus community. Uh, I think it's really important to be able to break down and understand each of the different types of diversity which make up this umbrella um, because there is a lot going on. So I would like to introduce you all to a tool that I have found incredibly helpful when it, uh, for myself personally when it comes to trying to understand all the different types of diversity that actually fall under the LGBTIAQ plus umbrella. Uh, we have four different facets of identity which actually fall under this acronym. We have gender identity, gender expression, attraction, sometimes known as sexual orientation, as well as biological sex. Biological sex is probably one of the more easy to describe aspects of diversity, which fall under the LGBTIQ plus banner. Um, generally speaking, it can be split out into male, female, and also intersex, which uh, although uh, not hugely common, it's about 2% of the population, it's roughly the same as the amount of people with green eyes, surprisingly enough. People who are intersex are actually born with sexual char characteristics um, of both male and female. Um, and for them particularly, it can be a little bit of a difficult, um, difficult time trying to uh, understand their gender identity as well, um, as their physiological expression combines two of the more traditional uh, gender roles. <laughs> Um, the second aspect of diversity that's included under the LGBTIQ plus umbrella uh, is gender identity. And it's probably one of the more complicated uh, topics that we'll discuss today. Um, let me just get to my notes. <laughs> um, gender identity is a very personal and individual experience. Uh, it is formed from a deeply held and internal sense of uh, how someone perceives their own gender identity. Um, and that, that can be whether or not they think of themselves as being male, female, uh, maybe aspects of both male and female, or in some cases, neither of these uh, traditional gender roles. Um, it's very important to acknowledge that we often make assumptions about people's gender identity based on their appearance, um, but um, this may not always align with their own 
personal sense of gender identity. Um, for certain people, for some people who are designated a certain biological sex at birth uh, and consider and continue to consider themselves, uh, for people who are designated a certain biological sex at birth um, and continue to consider themselves aligning with that, uh, that birth and that gender identity, we can refer to these people as being cisgendered. Um, for example, in the case of someone who is assigned male at birth, um, and still continues to identify as male or masculine for their gender identity, such as myself, we would refer to them as being cisgendered. For someone who is assigned a sex at birth, such as being male, um, but then later on during their life, they actually feel that their gender identity is more reflective of being more feminine, um, we would, uh, these, this, these people may potentially transition, uh, and we would refer to these people as being transgendered. The important thing to remember with gender identity is that it exists on a spectrum um, where there are no two uh, fully defined points. Um, for someone who considers themselves predominantly male in their gender expression, and maybe it has you know, some effeminate traits, um, they may internally consider themselves as being male and would refer to themselves as he, him, or his. Conversely, if someone considers themselves considers their gender identity as being more feminine and less masculine, they may refer to themselves as uh, female and go by the gender pronouns she, her, hers. There are also a, a range of people within the community who don't necessarily feel like that their gender identity aligns with being particularly male or particularly female. And for these people, they may refer to themselves as being gender neutral and use they, them, theirs pronouns. There is also another group of people within the LGBTIQ plus community who don't feel that their gender identity aligns with the more traditional um, representations of being male or female. Um, and for these people, they kind of sit outside this traditional gender spectrum um, and they may refer to themselves as being non-binary or genderqueer. They would predominantly use they, them, theirs or neo pronouns to describe their gender identity. Uh, and I didn't put the I didn't put the neo pronouns in here because I I cannot pronounce them myself, but um, they're quite interesting to look into as an alternate way to express your gender identity. Um, when it comes to gender pronouns, um, especially when you're unsure, it's always good to clarify it and ask someone. It's also really important that if someone shares their gender pronouns with you, to make sure that you use them accurately um, and uh, every single time um, and this kind of just helps to affirm for someone that has shared with you their gender pronouns um, that you accept and acknowledge the gender identity that they wish to assume. The third aspect um, of diversity that's included under the LGBTIQ plus queer umbrella is gender expression. Um, now this one is a little bit under, easier to understand especially after we've covered uh, gender identity but gender expression is basically the outward appearance of someone's gender expression. Um, and this can be expressed through many different things, such as um, people using makeup, uh, the clothing and accessories that they wear, the hairstyles that they decide to choose, body language and mannerisms, uh, and so much more. Um, some people do choose to also express their gender identity in ways that challenge or try to transcend traditional norms as well. Um, and this is particularly true of people who identify as gender non-binary and who feel like that their gender identity doesn't need to align with traditional norms uh, for gender roles or identities. The fourth aspect of diversity that's included under the LGBTIQ plus umbrella is sexual orientation um, or attract, sorry, I should say attraction. The reason I don't like to use the word sexual orientation is there are actually some individuals who uh, fall under the, um, uh, who identify as asexual, who may not necessarily have a sexual or romantic attraction to people. And that's why it's better to use the word attraction or interpersonal connection when referring to this type of diversity. Um, but basically attraction is who you are physically, spiritually, or emotionally attracted to. Um, like a lot of the other different types of diversity that exist under the LGBTIQ plus banner, um, this exists on a spectrum um, and it can also change over time as well. Um, when we're talking about um, 
interpersonal attraction. Um, there are many different subsections um, of interpersonal attraction. Uh, generally speaking, when someone is attracted to the opposite sex, or I should say the opposite gender, um, they would consider themselves as being heterosexual. If you're attracted to the same gender, um, you may consider yourself homosexual, um, such as being a gay or a lesbian. Um, or there are some people as well who consider themselves bisexual, who are attracted to both of the more uh, traditional gender identities. There are also other people out there who identify as pansexual. These people um, are attracted to people regardless of their gender identity, and this is generally considered to be a bit more inclusive than bisexual, as they um, consider gender blind. They don't really um, care about someone's gender. It's more about um, just seeing them for who they are and how they wish to identify. And as mentioned previously as well, there are other people out there who, generally speaking, don't feel a, a huge amount of sexual or romantic attraction to people and more value friendships and those types of connections. And these people consider themselves as asexual. So you can see even under the um, interpersonal attraction element of diversity under the LGBTIQ plus banner, um, there's a lot of diversity going on here, which is why I think it's really important to go through all of the facets of uh, the gender bred person to help easily break apart all of these different types of diversity and make sure that we understand each aspect. Cool. Um, now that I've kind of just given you a big lecture on uh, the LGBTIQ plus community, uh, we can probably move on to maybe something that's a little bit more interested, interesting and relevant for this group here tonight. Um, but now that we acknowledge all the different types of diversity um, that exist within the LGBTIQ plus community, um, how can we now use that information to help design games that are more inclusive um, and make sure that they cater to these diverse audiences? And we can generally do this in two different ways. First one is representation, and the second one is player agency. Within representation, um, one of the best ways that you can help to represent uh, queer and LGBTIQ plus uh, individuals um, is through narrative and stories. Um, and we can do this by a number of ways, um, such as incorporating queer storylines and narratives um, that explore different aspects um, of experiences unique to the LGBTIQ plus community, um, such as queer or same-sex romances, um, aspects and topics which just explore people's gender identities and transitions, um, and other unique experiences such as uh, you know, coming out for, for uh, people who um, have a particular sexual or sorry, interpersonal connection. An important thing when telling narrative and stories about queer individuals is making sure that you don't just reduce queer characters to uh, stereotypes or tropes or just rely on their sexual orientation or gender identity alone to build out their characters. Um, it's really important to focus on making really diverse and very well fleshed out, uh, interesting and realistic characters uh, to make them believable and also to make sure that you are showing support um, for these individuals who actually exist in the real world. Speaking of uh, making authentic characters, that's our second point for representation. It's really important when you are designing characters within gaming uh, to make sure that you do include a diverse range of gender identities and expressions among non-playable characters. Um, especially when we're referring to uh, the hero characters or default playable characters within video games, um, it's all too often to default to uh, a cisgendered heterosexual white male um, and it's really important to make sure that we are challenging these stereotypes and that our hero characters can be anything um, across any different gender identity um, or sexual orientation. Sorry, I can't use that word correctly. <laughs> um, it's important to make sure that they're well-rounded and authentic um, and they represent the ideals of the LGBTIQ plus community. Um, it's also important to make sure we avoid problematic or outdated portrayals of characters. Um, I know in the past there were some examples from some older video games, um, which uh, particularly for transgender individuals were quite offensive. And it's important to make sure that we avoid these tropes uh, when developing games for the modern audience. Um, and it's also important to make sure that you're providing equal prominence and depth to each of your characters um, of all genders. Um, some great examples of this, especially in more recent times, are um, the likes of Ellie and Dina um, from The Last of Us 2, and Alloy and Seeker from Horizon, Horizon, I shouldn't put it in there, Horizon Zero Dawn, Forbidden West. <laughs> um, this was a really great uh, 
time to see um, some same-sex female characters or romantic relationships, which is not something that has really been seen in mainstream gaming community um, pretty much ever. Um, and it was a really good opportunity to, um, I suppose, represent and, and uh, explore different gender identities um, and, and interpersonal connections within video gaming. Another good example of this as well is the character um, Dorian from Dragon Age Inquisition. It's a little bit of an older example, um, but what I liked about uh, Dorian um, from Dragon Age Inquisition is that uh, his character is not only um, same-sex male attracted, um, but also his story became a prominent part of his backstory where his family uh, pretty much drove him out of home and he, he ran away because he was being uh, more or less forced to be a cisgendered straight person uh, and he did not want to follow suit. Really, another really good example and probably more recent as well um, is that of Serona Ryan um, from Hogwarts Legacy. Um, and I think this is a really amazing example, um, especially considering, considering all the controversy that's been um, around Harry Potter um, and JK Rowling and her views on transgender people. Um, the uh, developers um, at uh, Pocket Key Games actually uh, went and inserted a, um, a transgender character into, uh, into the game despite all this controversy. What I think was also really lovely about um, the use of Serona in Hogwarts Legacy is that her character wasn't forcibly put in front of the character. I think there's only one um one stage within the game that she mentions that she was mistaken for a wizard at one stage in her life but then she corrected the characters to say that she was actually a witch and that's all they basically say and it's a very nice natural authentic way um to make sure that her uh gender identity was well known uh moving on to other ways that we can make sure that um lgbtiq plus um uh, people are well represented within video games is definitely within online communities and events. Um, it's really important to make sure that you foster an inclusive and respectful player base um, through moderation and guidelines to make sure that people who are, um, uh, I suppose, um, hostile towards people of the LGBTIQ plus community um, are uh, dealt with accordingly. Make sure that we encourage players to use and respect each other's pronouns, as mentioned previously. <laughs> Um, provide tools and reports as well to address any harassment um, or discriminatory behaviour um, and also to feature um, or spotlight um, LGBTIQ plus um, guilds and clans um, and make sure that they're um, well supported. Another great way to um, support the queer community uh, within gaming as well is to make sure, um, especially around June every year when we hold Pride Month uh, internationally, um, is to run uh, LGBT. Uh, uh, Pride, we'll call these Pride Month events, um, and you can see some of the big uh, name titles, League of Legends, Fortnite, Old School RuneScapes, and Overwatch uh, doing their part to help represent and support the queer community. Right, so we've discussed uh, the first way that we can help support um, the queer community in um, for representation within uh, in the gaming community, sorry. The second way that um, we can help support them is through player agency. Um, this can be done through such things as character or avatar creation. <clears throat> and I guess the key point here is really being able to give control over to the players to pretty much diversify their character in any way that they want. The power of video games is that you get to role play, you get to insert yourself into a world that is not your own. And for people who um, especially uh, have trouble um, trying to understand or figure out what their gender identity is, uh, being able to role play these identities in video games can be a very empowering experience to help let them explore in a non-threatening environment um, a way that a, a sorry a, uh, an identity that they may not have realized um, that was actually at the core of their being. Um, the, great, the best way to do this is to make sure that all uh, all options within character or avatar creation are not locked to a particular gender, and that people can customize their character in any way that they like. Um, it's also important to, uh, Baldur's Gate 3. <laughs> if you haven't seen the character creator for Baldur's Gate 3, I really recommend you have a look at it too. Um, it's probably one of the better examples in terms of um, really diverse character, uh, sorry, avatar creation. Um, I really thought this was a great example where you've got an, a, you know, a stereotypically more masculine looking mm -hmm. orc with a, you know, amazing uh, bun haircut. Um, I just thought it was a, a really great example here. 
Um, I think another really important thing as well in avatar creation is to make sure that you avoid, sorry, it's a bit small there, directly referring to avatars as being male or female. I think it's really important to make sure that you are picking a body type and you're not picking a gender, um, especially for someone who uh, identifies as being gender non-binary. Um, it can be a really confronting choice where they're basically being told to pick, are you male or are you female? It's always preferable to give an avatar and just say, which do you identify with and let them to decide for themselves. Um, this is probably a bad example here where, um, I forget which game this was from, but um, basically telling you to choose, are you a male character or are you a female character can be a very confronting experience for someone who's gender non-binary. Um, this is also a good opportunity, even though not necessarily directly related to the LGBTIQ plus community, but also um, to make sure that we're empowering people um, of all different um, identities um, and body types within character creation um, to basically let them diversify their character in any way they want, or if necessary, reflect their own real world characteristics in game. Um, it's important to make sure that we are representing everyone of all say, shapes, sizes, and identities. Um, I thought this was a really good example as well um, about gender locking um, certain characteristics within game. This is from Lost Ark. Um, they actually have three different uh, types of classes, which are locked depending on um, what type of character you choose to create. Um, there are the gender neutral classes which you can pick, um, but then they also lock particular classes um, to male only avatars, which was probably a really good, bad example of how not to do um, gender identity and customization. Um, if you uh, were a female, um, if you identified as being female and you wanted to play a male character which reflected yourself and you wanted to play a berserker, um, you might felt, feel very jarred by this experience because you're not actually able to uh, personify your real world self in game and play that class. So it's just a good example of how not to do uh, gender locked content. Um, and conversely, they have uh, the female classes, which are a lot more stereotypical feminine and probably a bit over accentuated as well. Um, another way that we can make sure uh, within player agency that we're supporting gender identity is to make sure that people are given the choice to select their gender pronouns um, and to make sure um, that we include options such as uh, they and them or give the, the neo pronouns down there at the bottom, which is really good. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to say them because I cannot say them very well. Um, but it's also about making sure that people can change this at a later date if they also decide to, which I think is probably something that's becoming a bit more common at place these days, um, as people's gender identity does change over time. Um, and if they really want to, then they have the opportunity to change their character to align with this um, new gender identity. Uh, and the last way we can help um, with player agency within games, and this is more to do with interpersonal attraction within games, is to make sure that there are romantic options for um, and, uh, any gen any interpersonal attra uh, attraction orientation. Um, so it's a, like uh, allowing people to um, have romantic relationships with people of the same sex or opposite sex, and maybe even including um, non-binary characters as well to allow people to be able to romance um, people who they're attracted to and their gender. Cool. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. Any questions? Thoughts, comments? I have one. Yes. So, um, it, you know, as somebody who um, doesn't identify on the spectrum, um, I'm afraid that when I am writing some language, um, I might make a mistake and inadvertently make somebody feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. How can I check this if I'm building an app or something like that that does have gendered language? Um, I guess definitely. Um... If you have friends who identify as gender non-binary or gender queer, um, it's always great to ask them their opinion. Um, this will vary as well, um, depending on the individual. But I guess it's about trying to um, probably give people as many options as as possible, um, especially if it's on a gendered questionnaire or something like that. You can give options such as male, female, um, or non-binary. But then it also is always great practice as well to make sure you have a field where um, it's as many, uh, none of the above as well um, to allow people to uh, you know avoid that question if they don't feel like that they do identify with any of those. Cool. Any other questions? 
it's a bit of a different type of conversation today. Yeah. Hopefully next time I can come and present to you on user acquisition for mobile games, uh, which might be a little bit more headed to this crowd, but yes. Just wondering, in terms of the sales, do you have any stats on how the it's a good question. Um, I think it's more or less in line with what's happening with the world at large these days. Um, there is a huge social movement um, which is now coming to acknowledge all the different types of diversity um, that fall under the LGBTIQ plus banner. Um, and it's basically, um, it's not necessarily about um, increasing sales, it's just about giving people the option within games um, to be able to express themselves in any way that they want and basically handing the control over to the player to be able to uh, play the characters that they want to play and be who they want to be. So. Uh, yeah, but what I'm trying to understand is mm -hmm. maybe it's not about like money, but in terms of your know, user base, is it getting more traction? Most people see that they have more options, they get more valuable, that is. I don't have any direct crawl relation. Um, we did work on a game recently at Playside, um, Legally Blonde, uh, the mobile game, um, where we did allow gender diverse uh, character creation. Uh, we did have data from that to suggest that people were actually changing their gender quite often. Um, so we allowed them to change their gender at any time um, during their gameplay. Um, and we had statistics from that. It wasn't a, a huge amount, but um, for the small minority groups of people that are playing these games um, that maybe uh, that wouldn't have seen that elsewhere, I think it definitely would have made them stay around and probably value the game more because of those options. So it's a it's a hard question to answer. I think it's more just about making making sure that everyone's represented um, and there is no direct tangible link to monetization, um, but it's just about doing the right thing by the community, I think. So. How difficult is it to, um, in the dialogue, to if you pick a particular um, gender pronoun, mm -hmm. to make sure that um, it's not too hard, it's just hard coded in the back end to make sure that uh, when they make their selection, um, that's just surfaced every single time. I guess because the uh, the usage of um, pronouns in, in language is always consistent, um, so it's it basically it's just a, a swap out replacement for them, so it's pretty easy. So it verifies. Okay. Very much so. Uh, it's actually kind of, yeah, an interesting uh, extension onto that as well as when um, we're talking about character creation as well. Um, the, uh, in the past, it's been typical to have male, female uh, gender selection. Um, whereas these days, I, I would question the need to have that at all, when we just have sliders for different aspects of, of the character as well, um, and avoiding that question altogether. So, yeah. oh, another one It's an incredibly difficult um, question to answer. Um, I know in a lot of languages they have um, gendered uh, pre prefixes to, to nouns and things like that too. Um, so in English it does become a little bit easier for us. Um, for other languages I can't say I'm an expert on, on trying to figure out how that would be done. Um, and I know that within the commu queer community, especially um, of uh, different languages, uh, they are trying to tackle those types of issues, um, but it's, uh, it's uh, very intertwined with the language, unfortunately. So it's, it's a bit of a struggle, so. All right, thanks cool. very much. Thank you. Cheers.